This guy was so afraid that somebody was going to walk him in a room, one of the horrors of that life. He just couldn't deal with it. He said, I can't live like this. He told me this once, twice, three times. I kept telling him, calm down. Don't worry about it. I'm going to straighten it out. Turns out I got on a plane. I was heading down to Florida. I get off the plane and I get a phone call. It's one of the worst calls of my life. Hello everyone, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis and it is now Friday, August 28th. Summer's almost over. Hope you all had a, a good week and uh, mine was very interesting. Uh, did a couple of things this week, a lot of filming, providing a lot of content and it's a lot of work, but it's all good. I hope you're enjoying it. Oh, before I get started today, just a little bit of, of information that I thought was interesting. Uh, many of you may know that Steven Spielberg's father passed away this week. He was 103, same age as my dad. He was born on February 6th, same day as my dad. So they were born on the same day and uh, they died uh, in the same year at 103. Very interesting. What's the moral of that? I don't know, just that maybe February 6th, uh, if you're born on that date, you may look forward to having a long lifespan. But uh, anyway, Steven Spielberg, I'm sure he's, uh, you know, misses his dad like I miss mine. So uh, my condolences uh, to you, Steven. Today I want to talk about something that's um, it's very close to me, people. And, you know, I've been asked quite often, what was the ultimate reason why you left that life? And, you know, I can't my, put my finger on any one thing. It was actually a combination of things that happened throughout the course of my time in that life. Uh, but one of the things that, that um, you know, kind of played on me were um, the lives that were lost in that life, lives that were... Uh, meaningful to me that were close to me. I think I mentioned earlier in one video uh, about Artie Entrada, Artie the Animal. Uh, he was killed after he spoke at a, uh, a rally or a meeting for my father, spoke up in front of Joe Colombo. A couple of days later, he was, uh, he was killed in a, in a brutal way. Had a very you know, strong impact on me. He was uh, very, very close to me, and I described that situation. I want to talk about another person today that was very close to me, somebody I knew from my childhood. And uh, he also was murdered, um, uh, but a little bit different twist on this one. And unfortunately, throughout the course of my life uh, in the mob, a lot of people that were close to me or that I knew uh, were, were gone in different ways. Some of them were killed, other of them died in prison. Uh, but a lot of people were killed. And unfortunately, murder is a part of that light. I'm not talking out of school. Um, most of you know that um, it's just violence is a part of that life. And sometimes you lose people um, that you wish you hadn't lost, uh, people that were very close to you. In my case, there were a few. And uh, that's tough, people. It really is. But, you know, I understand you have to play by the rules in that life. And if you violate the rules, um, you can pay for it very severely, pay for it with your life. Uh, and there are times when, according to the life, it's justified. There were other times when maybe it wasn't justified. People got killed for other reasons. Jealousy sometimes, envy sometimes, you know, you never know. It's part of that life uh, just like it is in everyday life. But I want to talk today about a, a, someone very close to me. His name was Tony Orgello. They called him Tony the Gawk Orgello. And the reason they called him that because he was a big guy. He was six foot two. He had hands that were huge. And I knew Tony since I was a kid because he was very close to my father. He was a soldier in the Colombo family. He was part of my dad's crew when my dad was a captain. And so he was always around from the time that I was a kid. Knew him really well, and I loved him. He was a very affable guy, very outspoken, had a very deep voice. He was a real tough guy. You know, he was involved later on with the unions and, uh, you know, Shylocking, extortion. He had a club and very close to my dad, very protective of my dad. And uh, I loved Tony, really loved Tony. And then when I got inducted into the life, my father was in prison. Tony and I remained close. I'll never forget a funny story with him. Uh, when we were picketing the FBI building on 69th Street and 3rd Avenue, told you about that. Joe Colombo called for us all to picket. 
And so we're picketing that line day after day after day. And guys were not used to that. You know, these are tough guys, made guys. You know, I was a young guy at that time. And uh, they're walking that line every day. And they weren't happy about it. I got to tell you, some of them were complaining. You know, it was the thing. And Tony was very vocal about it. But he was loyal. He had to be there. You get an order from the boss to pick it, you pick it, right? So uh, I'll never forget one day Tony and I uh, are close to each other, right, in the line. We're walking. And all of a sudden, out at the top of the building, it was in the FBI building, they were way up, I don't know how many stories up, they started throwing water balloons down on us. They were so upset that we were picketing and disrupting the street and their, their entranceway into the building, they started throwing down water balloons. And uh, one of them hit Tony on the head, right, and exploded. And he looked up, and I'll never forget, he said, all right, you want to hit us with water balloons? That's okay, just don't be hitting us with indictments. And he looked up like that and everybody around him, you know, cracked up. But that was the kind of guy he was. Anyway, um, you know, one thing in that life, um, at least in the Colombo family, in the Colombo family, we were not allowed to mess with drugs. The night I got inducted into the family, I was told straight out, you deal with drugs, you die. Remember in the Gotti movie when Carlo Gambino was talking to you know, Armand DeSanti, John Gotti? And he said, no drugs, you deal with drugs, you die. You know, and he said it very forcefully like that. Well, that was true in the Colombo family. We were not allowed to deal with drugs. And there were guys that were doing a little drug deals here and there, you know, it was happening. But in the Colombo family, we were not allowed to deal with drugs. And I don't know of any of my associates at that time that were doing that. Well, uh, Tony just so happens in the 70s, I think it was the mid 70s, if I recall, he came to me and he said, Michael, I'm in trouble. I said, what happened? He said, no, my father was in jail, so he and I were still tight. We we're both made guys. And he said to me, Michael, I'm in trouble. I said, what happened? He said, I got involved in a little drug deal. He says, with somebody that came out of the joint, you know, we started messing around a little bit with it. He says, and I found out we're dealing with undercover cops. He said, I think I'm going to get pinched. Ah, uh, Tony, come on, man. You know you're not supposed to be doing that. What the heck, man? I know, Michael, you know, I want to get a few bucks. I didn't want to do it, you know. So anyhow, I said, look, you know, don't worry about it. I'll get it straightened out. I said, you know, you've been around for so long, Tony. You're a loyal guy. Joe Colombo loved you. Joe Colombo had already been, you know, uh, shot, and he was in a coma for, for many years. But I said, don't worry about it. Persico had taken over. I said, don't worry about it. We're going to straighten it out. Let's see what happens. Turns out, you know, not too long after that, boom, he gets pinched, he gets indicted with a couple of guys. And uh, from that point, it gets even worse. Because what happened was, he drew in Carmine Persico's son, Ali Boy, who I was very friendly with at the time. He was a soldier, he was a made guy at that time. Somehow, Tony drew him into the deal. So Tony came to me and he says, Mike, this is getting even worse, man. I said, what happened? And he told me Ali Boy got involved. He says, and I'm going to be in trouble. I says, well, look, Ali's not a baby. If, if he got involved with you, he knew what he was doing. And Tony was scared. He said to me, Mike, come on. I bring the boss's son into a drug deal. You think they're going to make him take the wheat? Junior's going to make him take the wheat? That was Persico's name, Junior. Uh, he said, they're going to lay it on me. I'm going to get in trouble. I said, Tony, don't worry about it. You've been around for so long. You're a good soldier. Everybody knows your heart. Don't worry about it. I'm going to straighten it out with Ali Boy. It turns out that Ali Boy Persigo baptized my son, John. He's my gumbada. Um, I believe that was for my, before my son was born, though. I don't remember exactly. But I said, don't worry. I'm close with Ali. We're going to straighten this out. So uh, I, I'll never, he says, you know, I ain't going to look over my shoulder every day, Michael. I know this life. I've been around a long time. I said, Tony, don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. I'll tell you what happened. This guy was so afraid that somebody was going to walk him in a room, one of the horrors of that life. He just couldn't deal with it. He said, I can't live like this. He told me this once, twice, three times. I kept telling him, calm down. Don't worry about it. I'm going to straighten it out. Turns out, I got on a plane, I was heading down to Florida. I get off the plane and I get a phone call. It's one of the worst calls of my life. Tony was so scared, I would say, that somebody was gonna walk him into a room. He goes into a phone booth, calls up his wife, tells his wife, honey, I love you. You know, I love my, the kids, you've been a great wife. And she doesn't understand what he's saying, hangs up the phone, takes out a, a 38, I believe, and shot himself in the head. He wrote his own contract. 
And uh, I was devastated when I heard it. Uh, I couldn't believe it because this guy was a tough guy. When I say he was in fear, I don't mean that he was scared like a scaredy cat. You know, if that's the right word, it's an old word. But he just didn't want to get walked into a room. He said, I don't want to go out that way. And uh, he had enough courage to shoot himself in the head. And, uh, you know, I never forgot that. You know, first it was Artie and then it was Tony. But, you know, I got to be honest. We're told straight out. You don't deal with drugs, you deal with drugs, you die. So he violated the rules, no question about it. He was more concerned because he brought uh, Persico's son, Ali Boy, into it. And uh, he thought he would get killed. And quite honestly, I don't know if I could have saved him. He might have gotten killed. I don't know. They made her try to call on me because I was so close to him. So I, I don't know. But, uh, you know, people, it's things like that that, uh, that really start to make you, make you think about that life. And again, violated the policy. We're told straight out, you got to play by the rules. If you don't, you could pay for it with your life. And in this case, it was, it was a sad situation. That's what happened. And, you know, unfortunately, throughout my time in the life, uh, there were other guys that were close to me that made mistakes and ended up paying for it with their life. You know, I think I told you the night that I got straightened out, there was, uh, there was six of us that night. I'm the only one alive today. The other five guys I was told were all murdered. I believe they were. But unfortunately, death uh, and death by violence is a major part of that light. And, and don't let anybody tell you different. If they're, if they're trying to soft stroke it, they're being honest with you. I don't like to talk about it. Um, it, it again, it's one of the, uh, the low points of that life. But I thought I would tell you this because there wasn't one, any one instance that made me walk away from that life. I wasn't mad at anybody. I didn't have it in for anybody. I didn't want to get even with anybody. I had my bickering with people back then. Yes, there was guys that I liked a lot, guys that I didn't care for as much. We had our disputes. All part of the life, you understand. It's part of the territory. I didn't leave the life because of that. I didn't seek revenge on anybody. I didn't want to hurt anybody. Uh, and I tried my hardest to make sure that I didn't hurt anybody, never put anybody in prison, wouldn't do that. But it was all these things when I finally started to look back and think about it. And then, you know, other, other issues came up. You know, the government coming up with the racketeering laws. So many guys turning informants. So it was that. It was the government, you know, with this arsenal of new laws that they had. The racketeering law, the Bail Reform Act, the Sentencing Reform Act. All of these things. You know, I had an incident where, you know, I, I mentioned it in the past that I was called into a room one night and maybe... You know, I was fortunate to be able to walk out of that room. Uh, you know, an incident where my father might have betrayed me, and I'm not laying this on my father. I love my father. I'm just saying it's all these things that are a product of that life, that are part of that life that you start to realize, like, what am I really involved in here now? I'm not knocking my dad. My dad was, you know, he, he kept that omerta till the day he died. That was his principle. An old school guy, I get it. And maybe you could look at me and say, hey, Michael, you didn't live up to that. Well, you're right, I didn't. Didn't put anybody in trouble, but I have been speaking about the life. Um, and uh, I wanted to preserve the life of my wife and children. That was my decision. I also became a Christian. You can't be a Christian and be a member of the mob, okay? It's, it's, it's just the complete opposite in many, many ways, all right? Um, you know, and I'll, I'll mention this. There were a lot of guys in that life that were Catholics. On Ash Wednesday, you'd see them with ashes on their faces and some of them on their heads and some of them went to church. A lot of them fought in the military. They were good guys, but we, we live by that code. And it's kind of a, 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 you know, a direct contradiction to a life of faith. So a lot of those things kind of came together that, that gave me a decision to walk away from that life. And of course, you know, I met my life. Uh, my wife was a young Christian girl, and her and her mother had a very strong impact on me. And, uh, and as a result, I became a person of faith. So I thought it was important, you know, to tell you this story. What I'm trying to do here, people, is give you some real insight into that life. Because there's a lot of stuff out there. A lot of times the media gets it right. A lot of times they get it wrong. A lot of times the movies get it right. Other times they get it wrong. But when you hear it from me, you know, as best as I can recall and relay it to you, you can pretty well take it to the bank. I might make a mistake on a date here and there. You know, this is, we're talking 30, 40 years ago. I left the life 25 years ago. So you got to understand, but you can pretty well take it to the bank when I, when I relay something to you. So 
That's it for today. Hope you understand the moral of the story. I don't care what you're involved in. All right. When you agree to play by the rules, you better make a conscious decision and know what rules you're playing by and then stick to them. Because whether you're on the street, whether you're in a legitimate life, whether you're a person of faith, when you agree to pay, play by the rules, you play by the rules because there could be consequences that are very severe in your life. That's the moral of the story. But before you accept something, make sure you know what you're accepting. That's what's important. So we're going to end it for today. Monday is going to be Mob Movie Monday, and I'm going to review Fear City, the Netflix show that I played a role in, that I uh, interviewed for. Uh, I haven't watched the whole thing yet, but I'm going to watch it. I only watched the first episode. I think they did a good job in it, but that was my time, my era, and I'm sure I can fill in some of the blanks. Watch the movie, Fear City. You can pull it up on Netflix. If you've got questions about it, prepare them. A lot of you are asking me, uh, you know, sending me questions, and I try to do my best, but I want to tell you something. I have an inner circle, michaelfrancis.com, inner circle, people that are close to me that have joined my crew. There is a small fee involved. It's not going to break the bank. Trust me on that. Go and investigate it. But if you really have questions that I can answer and I provide to my crew, we do a Zoom call at least twice a month. I get on the, the call individually with people. They ask me questions. I respond to them. Many are about life skills, about, coach, uh, about uh, business skills, um, and about other things in their life that they want to know about, leadership. And we talk about it, and I think it's been uh, very, very productive. We're going to continue that. We're providing a lot of content on that site. There's also a free site. Become a member of the crew. If you want to join, join up. On the YouTube channel, subscribe. A lot of good stuff coming up. I'm going to be interviewing Bruce McDowell. Wayne Gretzky owned the Kings, filmed a bunch of movies. We did a little uh, video about him uh, not too long ago. And I got a lot of good um, uh, interviews coming up. But subscribe so you get alerts. You're also part of my YouTube crew. I appreciate it. You've been very loyal. Thank you very much. So that's it for today. God bless you all. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Stay healthy. See you Monday.